Um, thank you all for attending uh, today's meeting. Uh, today's meeting is being recorded by Westwood Media. Is anyone else like to record today's meeting? Okay, great. Um, and these microwaves, just, uh, microwaves, microphones, <laughs> maybe microwaves. Microphones, you know, don't, they're for the uh, Westwood Media, so uh, you won't hear me being broadcast. So great. Um, so we have a great night. I'd like to thank you again for coming. Um, I think I'm going to hand it over now to Don with our uh, partner at the architecture firm uh, to start the presentation. Thanks, Tony. Hi, everyone. Uh, Don Walter, principal with uh, Dorm Woody Architects. And uh, with me tonight, we have Jason Boone and Mike Parolo, who are educational planners, and Glenn Gallrad, who is a uh, project architect on the team. So any questions you might have afterwards, uh, we'll all be around here to help answer that. So tonight, what we'd like to do is um, take you through an overview of what's been a pretty lengthy and intense process. So give you a sense of, of where we've been, what we've accomplished, and then uh, bring you up to speed with where we are with evaluating the options. If you recall the last time we came in, uh, we showed you 15 options to solve all the three uh, different populations. So we'll give you a quick overview of that and we'll get into the evaluation criteria. So, um, and then we'll open it up for questions, uh, talk about next steps, and then we have an exit survey because we want to continue to try and get feedback from the uh, community about the process and about some of the decisions that are being made. So in terms of the schedule, uh, where we are tonight, here on March 2nd, is we've gone through and developed, as I mentioned, 15 options. So we're going from the many options down to the few, uh, which is what happens here uh, near the end of this month. And that uh, then brings us those few options will lead us into the one. So between now and June, we'll narrow those options down to one preferred option, which we'll submit to the MSBA for their board approval in August, which then allows us to develop what's called the schematic design, uh, which basically brings that one option up into more detail so you get more accurate cost estimates. You'll know better what the building's going to look like, what the materials are, and things of that nature. Uh, which will take us up until uh, spring of next year uh, where you'll have an MSBA board vote on your project funding and your town votes to, uh, to support the project. Assuming all of, all of that goes well, we will then develop the design with what's called design development, construction documents to go through a bidding process, which will bring us into construction the spring, early spring of 2022 race through construction, um, very thorough documents, race through construction, and get us to the fall of 23 to open a new school. So uh, a lot to be done uh, over the, the next uh, you know, three years, but uh, certainly a very, very comfortable schedule, very doable schedule from our perspective. So in terms of some of the work we've done today, we've gone through and we've analyzed the three existing buildings, the Hanlon, Deerfield, and Sheehan. We've gone through all kinds of educational planning exercises with the principals, the faculty, and staff. Uh, we did school tours of similar elementary uh, schools within the area. You can see Needham, Millis, and Milford. And then we've had quite a few community meetings, nine, uh, nine to date, and we met with the, uh, the Board of Selectmen. So from our perspective, uh, we believe this has been a, a very, very thorough in a very inclusive process. So we, we thank everyone who's been able to come to uh, a lot of these meetings and, uh, and really follow along and, and participate. And then, of course, we've developed the options that we'll talk about a little bit uh, here tonight. Uh, here's some photos from some of those meetings. We've you know, gone from uh, basically developing classrooms to uh, developing buildings, talking about school furniture, you know, having a lot of the feedback from the community with uh, some of the sticker comments and whatnot, and all that's been taken into consideration with uh, the options as they've been developed. You know, it went so far as to, uh, to really develop a, a school uh, planning diagram. So uh, it's been very helpful to the, uh, to the entire design team. So I'll go pretty quick with these because we went through in a lot of detail at the last meeting. 
but I'm going to take you through from the populations uh, of each option. So what are the options? We have, in the MSBA's eyes, this is a, a Hanlon School project. That's the building that was accepted into their program. But in addition to the Hanlon School, they've also asked the town to look at what if you did a consolidation. And the consolidations are Hanlon and Deerfield at 560 students, or Hanlon and Sheehan at 685 students. So with Hanlon only at 315 students, that would be at the Hanlon site. If it's Hanlon Deerfield, that would also only be at the Hanlon site. But if it's Hanlon and Sheehan, it could be either at the Hanlon site or the Sheehan site. So we've, we've looked at uh, all of those scenarios. And with Hanlon, we do what's called a, a renovation only option or a, a baseline option just to repair the building. What would it cost to fix the building to keep it operational for the next 30 to 50 years? It does not address capacity. It does not address the programmatic needs within the building. So that's something to keep in mind uh, as we look at these options. Well, and all the rest of the options that we looked at will address capacity and educational uh, programming. So we have an additions renovation option and a new option for the 315 students. And then you go to the 560 student, and again, we have an addition renovation option. And in this case, we had four uh, different new options. And with Hanlon and Sheehan, we had two addition renovation options, because one's at Hanlon site, one's at the uh, Sheehan site, and then we had the new options either on the Hanlon site, Hanlon site or the uh, Sheehan site. So that counts the 15 that we've gone through uh, in quite a bit of detail, and there's been a lot of great discussion between the community groups and working with principals and staff and the, uh, the school building committee. So uh, again, a really, uh, really great process. So if we start with Hanlon and look at the 315 students only, the, uh, the first option, uh, the base repair, that's that renovation. So essentially owned up with the existing building, fixed up. So it doesn't address any of the capacity or the pro educational needs. Addition and renovation, uh, that will address both the capacity and the uh, educational program. In this case, the existing building ends up with a, uh, a simple classroom addition to it. And then an all new option uh, located, if this is the existing building, basically over to the e uh, west side of the uh, existing building uh, with an all new uh, two story building. And then when we get to the 560 student population, uh, we always start with an addition and renovation option. You can see the outline of the existing building, and then basically uh, two wings added on two stories. It starts to grow it out, grow out into the, uh, the field areas. We have uh, what started as a butterfly and became a tree uh, option, uh, which is a two-story option with the, uh, the classroom uh, wings located at the north end of the site and the uh, public spaces located at the south end. Uh, we call this the school in the woods. So what happens is where the fields end, there's a little bit of a rise up into the woods. This, uh, this building, if that line is about here, this building would be placed up in that area. And then another uh, all new option is uh, up in the woods also. But uh, what happens here is you have to go through some um, classroom space to get to, grade space to get to other grades. So there's some transitional uh, challenges that happen with this option as opposed to this guy where you end up with singular grades in each of the, uh, the branches of the tree in that case. Uh, another all new option uh, was to have some of the, uh, the longer legs off of a large uh, public space here. Uh, what we call the backward Z which is very similar to the tree option with the singular grades, two stories uh, stacked on top of each other. And then, uh, so that, I'm sorry, so that uh, finishes the 560 students. And then moving into the 685 students, similar to what you just saw, only we basically add the additional classrooms to accommodate the, uh, the capacity. So that's the addition and renovation option, growing off of the existing. The, um, on the Hanlon site, Looking at the Sheehan site with addition and renovation, you save a bit of that existing building, the cafeteria, the gymnasium, uh, basically take down the oldest portion of the building. That's the most challenging portion in terms of handicap accessibility, in terms of the size of the programmatic spaces, 
uh, in looking at the construction to try and make some of those, those existing spaces larger is very challenging with the concrete waffle slab and some uh, uh, bearing wall construction. But uh, so we, we saved a portion of the building and then basically from here out would all be new uh, growing out of that in the addition renovation option. We um, ended up with a tree option for the 685. We're back to the Hanlon site now. Uh, again, with larger classroom uh, wings uh, on that. And then the backwards E, same as the 560 with the larger wings on it. And then lastly, going back to the Sheehan site, I should point out, the, the Hanlon site, including the woods, which could be developed, is about 46 acres. When you look at the Sheehan site, when you take into consideration the actual school site in the, in the fields, it's 10 and a half acres. So just by the sheer size of the, uh, of the site, you can understand what some of the challenges might be. And when you start looking at building options on here, if the existing building is located right here that's dashed, you end up with what is a 685 student school, two stories tall, basically takes up the existing play space that's out there now, uh, plus moves into the existing parking area. And, and really all of those, all of those options, uh, we've made it work. We, we've kept it out of the buffer zone for the, uh, for the wetlands, um, but you can see bus drop off and parking, uh, there, there are challenges, but uh, it's, it's more, of a, uh, more of an urban situation uh, than, the, than the Hanlon site in terms of how you would plan that particular building. So that quickly takes you through those options. We can definitely jump back to them uh, later if you want to get into any, any kind of detail, but I think now I'm going to turn it over to Emily to talk about the evaluation process. did not think I would be holding the microphone, so I have a lot of notes to juggle here. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us. I, I feel like I'm seeing some faces that I've seen in every meeting, so thank you for continuing to come back and be part of this process. Um, so as Don said at the last meeting, we were introduced to those 15 design options, and since then, we have been going through the process of beginning to evaluate the options. Um, we formed um, a subcommittee to take a look at um, sort of the pros and cons of each of those design iterations. So you've seen this graphic before, um, so I'm going to skip through that quickly. So there's a subcommittee of the school building committee that met and we developed a set of criteria that we would use to, to assess each of these options. And I do want to emphasize that that criteria really included a lot of the feedback and input that we've heard from the community about the kinds of things that are important to the community and what you want us to consider. So um, broadly speaking, we have here these overarching categories that we're looking at. Um, and we started trying to apply them to the different design options. The goal at this point, the objective, isn't necessarily to say what is the best option, rather it's to say which are the options that we think we should be leaving on the cutting room floor at this point, right? So we're whittling down to a more manageable list and saying which are the options that we think really are not so desirable or aren't really feasible at this point. That will get us to a short list so that we can then really do sort of the next level of analysis and start to do a deeper dive into these evaluation criteria. The dotted line here on the screen is because when the committee got together, we um, first took a look at what's above the dotted line and we tried to look at that in isolation objectively before then being introduced to cost. So that's how we thought about it initially. So for each of the evaluation criteria, we developed a guiding question or questions. This is what we were trying to answer. So for education, how well does the option meet the educational goals? We're gonna come back to these questions in a second, so I'm gonna go through them quickly. Uh, to what extent does the option provide benefits to the community, such as sports fields, community space, and gym space? Site, how well does the option maximize on-site parking, allow for efficient um, drop-off and circulation, and provide access to parking for sports fields? Sustainability, how well does the option align with the sustainability goals of the town? 
traffic, what is the impact the project would have to the traffic in the neighborhood and the town? Logistics and construction impact, what's the impact to students on the project site during construction and how difficult would the phasing or logistics be? And then cost, how do costs compare in relation to cost per student, um, sort of comparatively from option to option? So the evaluation subcommittee first met to determine the criteria. The school building committee then accepted those criteria. The subcommittee then applied the criteria to the options. We went and presented that to the full school building committee at our last meeting. We're presenting it here to you tonight. And at the March 20th school building committee, that's when um, the SBC will vote on the uh, recommended shortlist of options. So this is a lot on the screen. Let me tell you what you're looking at. So this is our, our uh, evaluation criteria matrix. So you'll see running along the side, we have the different evaluation criteria. And then for each one of the design options, we have rated the option against the criteria using a one to five rating, uh, five being the best. And we have um, a color coding system here, which I actually think is really helpful because you can kind of instantly get a sense of which design options fared better. Um, so clearly things that have more green are doing better in terms of this evaluation criteria. Um, and I think that just sort of with a thousand foot view, when I look at this, what, um, what I start to notice is that there's a lot of green here in the center. And if I think, well, what do they have in common? They tend to be new construction options as opposed to ad reno, and they do tend to be at the Hanlon site. Um, and so I'm gonna, we're gonna take you through each of the criteria so that you can see how that kind of unfolded. So I'm gonna start just by looking at education. And um, you remember that our question for education had to do with how well um, do the options meet the educational goals in Westwood? We've done a lot of work around those goals this fall. A lot of that community visioning that we were doing was in preparation for writing what's called the education plan. The education plan um, is a pretty extensive articulation of what we want teaching and learning to be in Westwood. And um, out of that came some guiding principles for design. So some of the things that we determined were we are interested in retaining a small school feel by keeping grade level clusters or neighborhoods. We're interested in having extended learning spaces, um, which we've seen in some other buildings and think are being used really effectively. We need ample small group breakout space. We want purposefully designed special education space. We want some good performance space, art studios, um, and we're really looking for a design that gives us a division between public and private space so that the building could have um, could be used for community uses in the evening and we would be able to sort of cordon off different areas so that's what we're thinking about for education so what does that mean so um, here are just I've taken sort of three design options to give you a sense of the range of the ratings so things that tended to get uh, dark green are things like this design. So you remember I said we wanted small grade level neighborhoods? You can see how this design achieves that kind of a feel, right? So this might be five classrooms, all of one grade. Uh, we have some small breakout rooms between classrooms. We have some specially designed special education space throughout the building. We have performance space here in this option associated with the cafeteria. And we have a clear division of public and private space. So you could effectively lock off the building here in the evening and have community space. Um, good extended learning areas for each of the grade level clusters. So I would say that for the educators, for the principals, when we looked at that design, we got very excited about that design. We felt like this design, um, we could see realized the input that we had given the architects and that we could see what we've been talking about kind of coming to life here. So that got 
high marks. An example of something that was a four is um, this option. Still a lot of things to recommend it. We do see grade level clusters. We do see a division of pub public and private space. But as we've been thinking about it, we think that our preference is sort of one grade per wing as opposed to this more linear design where you would have two grades and it's just sort of a farther distance for some kids to travel as they're going to specials. That kind of transitional time is just important for us when we think about um, thinking about instruction. So still very good, but not quite as good. And then here um, we have an example of something that got rated lower. Um, and in this case, it's an addition reno for Hanlon-Deerfield consolidation. And generally what we found is um, there's just less flexibility with addition renovation to sort of design the things that we're looking for. So in this case, you see this dark line is the footprint of the original building. And so we have classroom wings down here, but they don't have the same kind of extended learning space and the small breakout rooms um, that you can have in the new wing. And so we were concerned about having sort of a different experience here and here for kids. So that didn't accomplish um, all of our goals to the same extent. So the next criteria that we took a look at was site. Um, and I should say that a lot of the criteria, when you start thinking about it, clearly are interrelated. But we were trying with the ratings to um, sort of separate them out. So when we're thinking about site, we're saying how well does the option maximize parking on site, um, allow for efficient and safe circulation for pickup and drop off, and that's both in terms of buses and also in terms of cars, and does it provide access to parking for sports fields? So when we take a look at sort of the types of things that did well and not as well, Here's an example here of something that was rated most highly. And if we just look at it from the perspective of site, traffic circulation, what we notice is that here on the Hanlon site, because there's a lot of room, we're able to sort of move things back from the road. There are lots of options about how you can um, create these um, car loops, for example. This bus queue here would allow sufficient room to get the number of buses that we need to get. We're able to create parking that's in close proximity to the entrance and also to the fields. Um, and so we felt like this was a site plan that met our goals pretty well. Um, if we come over here, take a look, this is an ad reno for a Hanlon Deerfield option at Hanlon. Again, it's a little less flexible because you have to um, take into account the footprint of the existing building. But still, there's quite a bit of room on this site. But we, we rated it down a little bit. You can see here that the bus queue is right up against the street. Um, the current bus queue at Hinland is very tight. Um, but we didn't think that this um, was as effective as, as over here, for example. Um, and then what we found was that generally speaking, when we started to look at these issues at the Hanlon site, things were just a little bit more challenging. Um, and I think that has to do, oh, sorry, the Sheehan site, thank you, the Sheehan site. Things were a little more challenging. Um, and so that has to do with, I think, two things. It has to do with just the fact that the site isn't as large is one thing. Um, and it also has to do with the fact that we're thinking about um, some features of sort of where the site is located. So for instance, right here, we rated this fairly low. We think that the bus loop is not long enough. This would be a school of 685 students, keep in mind. And this bus queue really would only allow about seven buses at a time. Um, when we think about are there ways to extend the bus queue, on this side, there's a curve in the road on Pond Street, so we don't want to bring the buses, the bus queue back too far. And in thinking about um, car loops for parents and entrance and exits from, from the parking lot, we're also mindful of the fact that there's an intersection between Pond and High Street. Um, and those of us who 
drive in that direction know that the traffic can get backed up at certain times of day at that intersection. So we were considering those kinds of things and thinking about the flow on the site. Um, next criteria is traffic. When we're thinking about traffic, we're thinking about um, what is the potential impact of the project on the traffic in the neighborhood and also in town. Um, we have done sort of an initial traffic study, but in the next round, we'll be doing a more in-depth traffic study. Uh, we also have some initial um, information back from our redistricting consultant. At the school committee in meeting in April, the redistricting consultant will be talking in depth about that. So really here, what we're thinking about is this. Traffic is impacted um, by the size of the school, by the enrollment, right? How many kids would be reporting to school each day? It's impacted by where the students attending the school are coming from. So we have to think about where are we transporting kids to and from. Um, and then it's also impacted by just features of, of the site. So when thinking about this, I do just want to look at this map together for a second. Um, so we're really thinking about, well, if we were to consolidate Deerfield and Hanlon at the Hanlon site, what would that mean in terms of how we would need to be moving kids around in town? And again, our redistricting consultant is looking at this in great depth for us. But there are some things that I think we can kind of tell from a high level perspective here. Um, so what's interesting about Deerfield is that our, the Deerfield school, which is right here, is the smallest school in the district in terms of population. There are fewer than 200 kids. But you can see that it's actually a fairly large geographic distance. So when we think about where the um, sort of population density is in town, the Deerfield district does not tend to be as densely populated as some of our other uh, districts. So um, roughly speaking, if we were to consolidate Deerfield and Hanlon, it seems that we could pretty much erase the line between the Deerfield and Hanlon districts as our redistricting strategy. I'm talking in broad strokes here, clearly, right? What we also know is um, that a lot of students at Deerfield, again, because of the geography, currently take a bus to school. So when we're thinking about traffic impact, what would that mean? Well, on a given day, uh, currently, there are about 60 students who arrive to Deerfield not on a bus. So either walking or they're dropped off. Everybody else is already on a bus. And so I think that we could assume that those buses that are going to Deerfield would need to keep going down Gay Street. And so there would be a traffic of impact of about seven buses going to Hanlon that don't currently go there now. And then there would be some other impact having to do with some other number of students who might then take a bus or they might continue to be dropped off, probably not walking, given, given the map, right? So there clearly would be some impact. When we start, but, but not that much impact, right? Some buses going from where they're dropping off now, Deerfield, dropping off in Hanlon. When we start to contemplate a Sheehan-Hanlon consolidation, that clearly would involve more redistricting than in the first scenario. The redistricting would look different if we were consolidating at the Hanlon site or the Sheehan site. And it's clear that it would involve moving more kids across town in that consolidation scenario. So we thought about those issues when we thought about the ratings. So you can see here in terms of traffic impact, we don't have many things that we made dark green because we think that any change will have some impact, right? Um, we do think new Hanlon only would not have much impact. It would still be roughly the same number of kids, a few more because this is a design enrollment of 315, um, but not much change. 
Um, what it would do in terms of traffic oops, is that a new Hanlon would give us the opportunity to change the current parking situation, which is the cars that back out onto Gay Street. Right? And so um, that was why that got the dark green, because we think from a safety traffic perspective, having the cars back out onto Gay Street is a little problematic now. So that would be an improvement. The other things that were rated fairly well here is a new Hanlon Deerfield consolidation. And that relates to some of the things I was just talking about in terms of buses and redistricting. And then things that were rated less highly were Hanlon Sheehan consolidations. And in our assessment of what it would mean in terms of moving kids in town, we think that um, the most disruptive scenario would be the consolidation of Hanlon and Sheehan at Sheehan. That would involve moving more kids. And then we rated as a two, the Hanlon Sheehan consolidation at Hanlon. Okay. And I think I'm turning it over to Maya now, right? Yes. Okay, um, so that's education, site, and traffic, and I am moving on to community. And some of the issues we thought about with community, we've actually thought about in site. So for example, um, the difference between, the ability to lock down between public and private. We look, again, this is for the benefit of the community. So if we have after hour events, the community can come and go into those public spaces and it's easy for us to secure the academic spaces um, and allows more freedom of movement for the community. So that's one of the things we looked at. Secondly, we looked at opportunities for new fields that would benefit the community and potentially new gym. Um, these, as you know, are always in demand in Westwood, so we we're hoping that at least some of the, the, the design option would mitigate some of that crunch that we have. And finally, as a negative, we looked at designs that would take over or phase out existing fields, which would then require the town to relocate those fields somewhere else at an expense, either to the school or to the town. So that would have been a negative. Um, uh, it would have scored lower because of that. And one thing I want to mention is when we're doing the diligence around these designs, we tried to get as many stakeholders involved as possible. And so what we did specifically for the community aspect is we held two conference calls. The first call was with the Westwood High School Athletic Director, with Nicole Banks, who's head of the Westwood Rec Department. I was on the call, our architects and OPM were on the call, and also on that call was um, representatives from Westwood Youth Lacrosse, girls and boys, Westwood Youth Soccer, and Westwood Little League, because we wanted to really understand what each of those the fields needs were, what an ideal situation would be for those teams, for those organizations, and how we could potentially help them out. The second conference call was with the same initial people, the high school athletic director, rec department, me and the architects and OPM, and this time we had it with the Westwood Basketball Association because again, we wanted to understand what its needs were in terms of gym space, um, what's the crunch, where do they, do they have to hire gym space. So we're trying to get as much information as we can from as many stakeholders as we can in the community to make sure that whatever this project is, at least we can potentially mitigate some of the um, athletic issues that the town experiences. So with that, so and here's an example of the scoring. So as you can see, the best options that came up were really all um, new builds on the Hanlon site. And again, it's just a function of the fact that the Hanlon is a 46 acre site. So because of that, as you could see, well, first, let's take the public-private. As Emily mentioned, very easy in this design to cut it off right there. This is all the public space. This is all the academic space. And it's one very simple um, separation between the two. Um, in this one, public-private, not quite as easy. Um, you know, you'd have to separate there. And then you'd have to kind of do this little loop there. So this one wasn't quite as easy to separate for public and private spaces. 
Same with the existing, with adding and renovating at Hanlon. Um, you'd sort of, again, have to do a little bit of a loop here. Um, so not quite as clean and neat as the, as the middle design. And then moving on to the field space, and I, I should mention here that these are really test fit plans. These are just to see what can fit on the site. We're not locked into the location of these fields. Um, in fact, we may have room for additional fields. But again, just looking at these, the, the ones that scored the highest, you know, at, currently at Hanlon, right now, we do not use the fields for soccer at all. And we do use two, uh, one Little League baseball diamond. At Sheehan, if any of you have kindergarten or soccer players at some point, you'll know we have that huge field that we can configure in a number of different ways for everywhere from K all the way up through, I believe it's second or third grade, second grade. And then there's also two Little League diamonds there. So replacing the things at Sheehan is, is we'd have to replace more, at least fit more onto that site, and we're already with a constrained site. So for the community perspective from the field, um, she and Artie was, was sort of a, it had more it needed to accomplish on a smaller site. So in terms of field, again, this is, this is one that scored a five. We've got a brand new 11 v 11 soccer field. Um, so that would be a new field for the town. And potentially, you know, we would want to replace the existing baseball diamond. And I think our architects have told us that's, that's accomplishable on that site. Um, the existing Hanlon, we, do, we were able to fit an 11 v 11 soccer field here, but because of the location of the existing school, we might not be able to get a diamond on there. Um, so for that reason and for the public versus private reason, that was rated lower. And then on the Sheehan site, it's just super tight. Um, this is a 7 v 7 soccer field, so we would not be able to replicate the existing field that we had at Sheehan. And we could not get replace the two baseball diamonds, so we'd have to look for other space in the town um, if we wanted to keep those baseball diamonds in play, which Westwood Little League desperately needs. So Sheehan's site, again, is a little bit tougher from a community perspective. So moving on to sustainability, we don't, we're not showing any plans here because we took a high-level approach to sustainability. Um, basically what we did is all of the new buildings we rated as dark green because you have the maximum capability to implement sustainable principles and design into those. They're new builds. Um, you can do pretty much whatever you want with them. Um, light green was 600 and with renovations with 685 kids and yellow were renovations with 560 kids only because if you've got a bigger school you've got you are able to maximize your efficiencies more with sustainability and so that's why the two differences in the renovations and then clearly the existing Hanlon school if we're just bringing it up to code there's no opportunity for sustainability um, it's currently not um, very energy efficient at all, so that was rated the lowest rating. And then logistics and construction impact. So what did we look for here? First of all, you'll notice there's no dark green anywhere because whatever you do, you're going to have some impact on the site. So none of these were rated dark green. Um, we did see, we, you do see that the new build at Hanlon's are all light green and the new builds at Sheehan are all orange. And again, that is a function of space. So if you're doing a new build at Hanlon, most of those designs, the, the school is set further back into the woods. So the kids in the school, there's much minimal, there's more minimal disruption to the kids in the schools. Um, you know, the, the construction site is further back. They're not gonna hear as much noise. Um, the, and there would be clearly no shared walls or anything with construction in a new build. At Sheehan, let me see if I can get a, yep, so Sheehan, you can see here, the existing footprint of the building is here. So even if you're building new, you're still fairly close to where the kids are learning. And whereas here, here's your existing building in Hanlon, here's your new one in, Sh it, um, here's your new build. There's a, a fair amount of distance between the two. Here, not as much. So there's going to be more disruption to students at the Sheehan site, even though they're still in a separate building while you're building the new one 
If you're doing an ad reno, it's clearly the maximum amount of disruption. The kids are in the same building that you're constructing. You have to do it in phasing. So there's shared walls with construction. The kids are in one portion of the building while you're building out the other portion. Then you'd move the kids to the new portion and start renovating the old one. So it's really the maximum amount of disruption um, to the kids for all of these designs. And then in terms um, of staging and construction vehicle access, again, on the Hanlon site, you just have more room for those things to occur for staging of materials and for construction vehicles to access the site. Sheehan, it's gonna be a lot tighter. Um, you could potentially lose the playground temporarily at Sheehan, um, given where all of the construction activity has to happen. So for all of these reasons, four was rate, you know, um, the Hanlon site, new builds were rated light green and everything else kind of flowed from there. So this is, before we looked at cost, this is what we wound up with. Um, and what we are, what the, the, the subcommittee recommended to the SBC to move forward. So first we recommended to move forward a Hanlon only renovation. And as you'll see, the only reason we're doing this is because the MSBA is requiring us to do this. Um, it doesn't achieve the educational programming. It may not even meet the 315 student capacity. In fact, I'm pretty sure it won't meet that. But again, this is a requirement, so we have to move this option forward. We also need to move forward an ad reno option. So we decided to move forward an ad reno option at the Hanlon site that's a consolidation of Hanlon and Sheehan with the 685 number. As you can see, it, 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 it's, it scored probably the best. Um, it got a 20 as opposed to the 18 and 17 of the other two. So as a result, that one is moving forward as well. Of the, Han of the Hanlon sites, we're recommending we move forward a, a couple m new at Hanlon in the 560, and then a couple new at Hanlon in the 685. And then finally, we're moving forward one Hanlon Sheehan consolidation at the Sheehan site, because we haven't taken the Sheehan site off the table, so we are still moving forward with one of those options. So these, the purple ones, are the recommended ones that we are moving forward, but th that the evaluation criteria subcommittee has recommended to the SBC to move forward. As Emily mentioned, that vote will take place on March 20th. So now we get into cost. So here's a breakdown of the cost, and this is where we will likely have a little bit of sicker shock. <laughs> um, really, the, the cost of the buildings, <laughs> varied only, really only by population and whether, even if it was an addition, renovation versus new, the costs were fairly similar. It was really the population that was driving the differences in cost. Um, to renovate Hanlon only, just to bring it up to code and to, to get the systems up and running, um, as Don said, so it could last 30, 40 years, will cost approximately $25 million. And I should say that these numbers are very, very rough numbers. Um, they're not going to swing wildly, but these are not going to be the final numbers. We really won't have close to final numbers until we're through schematic design. But these, we use these for comparison purposes, really to decide, is one design much more expensive than another? And the conclusion was, not really. <laughs> Um, clearly, if you have a 315 kid school, it's going to be less expensive than if you have 560 kids, which is less expensive than 685. But whether you're looking at, so here, for example, are all the 315 schools. The difference between ad reno and new, fairly small. This is, again, just bringing it into code. Here's the 560s. Here's an ad reno, and these are all new. Again, pretty much the same cost. And this is the 685 number, ad reno, and all new. And actually, one of the ad renos is the most expensive option we even had. <clears throat> so what this shows us is we can either do these ad renos, which didn't score as high, or we can build a brand new building. And comparatively, the cost is the same. Can you explain what this oh, yep. Yeah. Yep, sorry. So the this is the initial number. L let's just take the 685 is $84.7 million for this building for an ad reno. If we wanted to add um, net zero 
or sustainability to, to reach net zero, it's an additional $5 million. And I would say that $5 million number is, is, is close for every building. It, it didn't vary wildly, dep even depending on the size. If we go back, you can see here it's 4.6, 4.5, 4.6. And then in the smaller schools, it's 3.6. So, the, so you'll see the, um, the green, that shows the, the amount of the net zero. So 59.5 million is the cost of the project, add an additional 3.5 million for net zero, and that's $63 million total. Yes, I believe, no, no. So what, what happens is, <coughs> We have to design to a certain level to get two additional reimbursement points from MSBA. Right. So it's essentially LEED certified is the level that you achieve. So that's all built into the base costs right now. If you want to do take further measures, you certainly could. But what happens is then your cost per square foot will start exceeding what MSBA would reimburse for. So it's fair to say that you really wouldn't be reimbursed for those additional costs. And I think as it is, our cost per square foot is above the cap anyway. Yes. So. Yes, and these numbers are before reimbursement. So this 59.5 million um, is without MSBA reimbursement. So that would be geothermal. Um, and really to get it to, to meet the net zero standard triple and triple pane glass. That's all built in, right? Yes. That's all built into the base building. So this is a summary of the recommended options that we're moving forward. The only one that's not on here is the Hanlon base building renovation, um, bringing it up to code. But the other six, these are the six that we that we are recommending the SBC approve for, to move forward to the short list. Okay, so now we're into questions and comments. I'm gonna turn it over to Tony to moderate. Uh, so thank you. So we, um, if you could just address questions, uh, we have a microphone um, for Westwood Media. If you could actually just state your name um, and question um, into the microphone and then somebody will handle it. Okay, okay thanks Ken. Any questions? Dave. Yes. Sir. Hi, the, um, David Warshe, president of Chase Estates, a 25-year Westwood resident. I think looking at everything carefully, I think some good thinking has been done, but I think at the end of the day, th there's a critical error here, which is trying to renovate any building. These are three you know, uh, buildings that are in rough shape. They're like over 70 years old, right? Sheehan, 1948, Deerfield, 51, same for Hanlon, right? Why throw good money after bad? You gotta figure out how to take out all three buildings, right? Take them out, and then build the, probably like the combined uh, Hanlon, you know, Sheehan type of approach, make it as big as possible, you know, even if it goes over the little 700, and then uh, be able to maybe distribute the remaining Deerfield kids am among, uh, that would be Downey and Martha Jones. And then that way we're operating with three buildings, which of course has the big benefit of lowering the operating costs looking forward. The annual operating cost of having three schools is definitely less expensive than five. I mean, that's a critical thing. It's not just the construction, it's operating in the future. I mean, if you look at Duxbury, where our, you know, uh, Superintendent Antonucci, you know, a former one, is there, I mean, for a similar size town, they have a 25% smaller, you know, school budget. I mean, sure, they don't have the same special ed and other resources, but they operate with three elementary schools. That definitely cuts costs out there. And, you know, by having a big building of uh, double-sized and then distribute the other kids, that way you're getting state-of-the-art engineering, environmental, security, all these benefits that you're not getting right now. And I think that's you know very important to uh, make that happen. And putting, good again, good money after bad is renovating any of the three buildings here. So I think that's my approach. And I still also like the Hanlon site the best because you have the most flexibility. Okay, thanks for the comment. Other comments or questions? Yes, go. Yeah, thanks, Ken. 
Hi, Jim Chaleo with Gay Street. The only question I have is I saw the, uh, they were boring test borers to see uh, what kind of ledge there is at, uh, at the Hanlon. So does, the, have the results of that come back and will that impact the construction costs? Don, do you want to take this? Thank you for the question. We, we have done some preliminary investigation as it relates to geotech uh, around that site. And uh, what we found, maybe it's not unexpected, we found uh, you know, a fair amount of glacial till, some small boulders, some larger boulders. So we know that the site's certainly buildable. If, if that site is selected and that location is selected, we'll certainly do more intensive uh, geotechnical exploration. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Yes, right here. Hi, Michael Breyer from Westwood. Um, a follow-on question about the uh, sustainability. That price, um, does that include the, pow the uh, power energy generation that would be whatever, solar, wind, or um, from the net, from the uh, grid also? How, yeah. how are you going to work that? Is that part of the five million? Or? What uh, we have not included uh, installing photovoltaics on the building, but we have included making it photovoltaic ready. Uh, if the Hanlon site is selected, you know, there is potential for a town project that would be uh, included that we could uh, tap into. That is correct. Other questions? Amanda Drainville, 57 Wentworth Street. Um, so there are six options that you guys have narrowed it down to. What, I guess, I, I saw all the evaluation process getting up to this point, but then what do you do with the six that you're moving forward? Like, how are you going to further evaluate those options to narrow it yeah, down? So the evaluation criteria subcommittee is, is basically going to do a much deeper dive into the, the six. There's actually seven if you include the Hanlon. Um, and that initial criteria, as Emily mentioned, was it wasn't high level by any stretch of the imagination. But we're going to take that criteria, add to it, and go deeper for the six. Um, and that's how we're going to arrive at the, at the final. So, so the next time we show, when we show the evaluation criteria, for the short list, I think you'll find it to be much, uh, uh, more extensive than what we had today. The other thing I would mention is that there are some additional evaluation criteria that we need to look at. So for example, the, the um, issue of redistricting, I think is a significant issue that we need to take a look at. The redistricting consultant is gonna be presenting to us in April, the date is escaping me, but it's going to be on a slide in a second. Thank you, April 7th. Um, and we will have to take a good hard look at that. So that would then be layered on to the evaluation criteria. Um, one of the things that we're going to ask you tonight when we get to that session is if there are other categories of things that you think we should be taking a look at as we get into the next level. Any others? Yes, Mom. Melissa Jonick, Fisher Street. My question is, how tied are we to the actual design of the building itself? So there's a lot of criteria around where will it be located and traffic, and but what about the actual design? I know in the previous meetings we've talked about things we like, things we don't like, but then once we narrow it down, are we still then another iteration of, okay, now what's the actual building going to look like and how it will be situated on the site? These are, these are still early concepts. Now, they're planning diagrams. They're certainly drawn to scale. All the adjacencies are certainly you know, well thought out. That discussion will continue uh, beyond where we are today. And they may be modified and refined. In fact, I, I know they will be, because it's, it's just how the process works. Uh, but we'll also be building, bringing the building up into three dimensions and starting to look at uh, floor to floor heights start talking about materials, start talking about uh, how windows are expressed in terms of sizes of openings, north facing versus south facing, shading versus you know, keeping things open. So all that starts to get brought more into play as we develop the designs further. So what would mean by that would not be part of the site? 
I, th I think it's fair to say that the general layout uh, would stay the same. The, the principles that went into it would remain. Uh, they certainly could evolve as we have further discussions, so yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dave. Uh, hi again. Uh, one uh, tough topic that everyone is also has to keep in mind, which is not up there, it's called political reality, I would classify it under. Looking at this project, you probably with the, what's only 40% uh, right, MSBA funding, right? It's no longer 59. We're probably talking the average homeowner paying X thousands of dollars a year more, right? We could be talking four or $5,000 a year or higher. This could be a, you know, a pretty sizable number. And what my point is, it's a once in a generation opportunity. If you're gonna do something, you know what I mean? You can't keep coming back every five or 10 years. You'll never get MSBA funding for another new building five years later. You know, it it's, it's, would be kind of crazy. You'll never get it. And you'll never get this approved by the voters without the 40% funding. I don't think anyone in town would vote for a project without MSBA funding because your, your tax bill would explode. It would be, you know, off the charts. Uh, that way. And of course, you got to keep in mind that we know under the current tax law change on the SALT, right there, you only allow $10,000 max. I mean, right, my house is 15 grand right now, so, you know, you add on another X thousands more, you know, you're not seeing any tax benefits to there. So I'm just saying you got to keep in mind all these realities out there and trying to look at it as a once in a generation project, one and done, you know, get rid of the old buildings and figure out the best plan for the new. And just sh shifting gears quickly, uh, on some of these projects, is there underground parking? Is that an option? Like, at, I'm just talking at uh, Sheehan to put, you know, a couple layers, you know, two or three layers underground, you know, for cars. I don't know what that adds f for a cost basis. Uh, a parking structure is always an option. What we found is it's just cost prohibitive uh, to do something like that. It could be a couple million dollars, you're saying? Oh, easy. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to address the issue of the MSBA reimbursement. Um, our starting point was 34%, but that number is subject to caps, and it's also subject to, um, to, to elements of the, the project that will not be reimbursable. So we are going to be looking at something that's less than 34% less than, you know, and, and I raised that because you said 40% and we're not even there even, <laughs> even to start. Um, the high school project was a different MSBA, you know, 20 years ago. And so we are not going to see that 60% reimbursement. And I just want to level set here. Um, the second point I want to make is, you know, we don't know the tax implications yet, but when we go to the town, we will absolutely know the tax implications. And everybody can go online, use the calculator, and figure out how much your tax bill will go up. Um, uh, which actually leads to the question of if we do the MSBA project, there's still one or two schools that won't be included. And I do want to address this because we've gotten this question a lot. Um, we are very w much aware that there's going to be one or two schools that are left out of this MSBA project. And assuming for the moment there is a consolidation and there's one school left, what the school committee has been discussing is that um, the school committee is going to look into allocating money um, for a study for that remaining school. Now in June, we will know what the final project is, so we'll know if there's a remaining school, I mean, what the, what the remaining school or schools will be. We're going to be ready in June to, to pull the trigger on a proposal to get, to fund a study um, for that remaining school and to the level that you're seeing here. So we will have options, probably an ad reno and a new build for the remaining school. And then we can take that, um, that study and you know, move it forward with the town. But I, I want everyone to be aware that we know that we have three schools. We've been talking about three schools from the start. It's the intent of the school committee to try and fully address the schools um, and, and we're hopeful that we can do that. We're also very aware that this is a tax burden on the townspeople, that you know, with the changes in the tax code, it will make this more difficult for people. We are trying to be as fiscally responsible as we can with this project, you know, conscious of the fact that there is another school or schools out there. And so we're really doing our best to try and be as, as um, I'll say it again, as fiscally responsible as we can because we know this is a burden on the taxpayer, 
Um, the schools haven't asked for any sort of operational or capital override in 20 years, so we do feel that it's time, but at the same time, what? Oh, sorry, we had an operational <laughs> override, a capital override. We have not asked for a debt exclusion um, in 20 years, so we're hopeful that the town will really rally behind this project. I just wanted to piggyback on that. I mean, Dave, I certainly appreciate your um, concerns about cost. I know you're very community-minded. Um, and undoubtedly, this is a major investment that the community would be making in, um, in infrastructure and, frankly, in the education of our children. Uh, I'm very aware of that. I, um, I do get a little bit nervous when I hear sort of numbers thrown around. I want to be very clear that by the time we get to town meeting, as Maya said, people will have a very specific understanding of what the impact would be on their tax bill. And I have to say with all due respect that I, um, you know, four to $5,000 for the average taxpayer, that it, that's, it will be significantly less than that. that I don't think that that number is, um, is a realistic number. And I just want to be clear, clear about that. So uh, I am a taxpayer myself. I understand what it means to examine your tax bill. And we will be um, as clear and upfront about what that, that impact is um, well before it's time to make, to make decisions. I did also want to clarify that, um, you know, there might be some, um, some sort of economies of scale if we had, um, had decided to consolidate all three buildings into one, one school. Um, but... That is not one of the options that we had if we wanted to work with the MSBA. Uh, we've used that term a lot. It's the Massachusetts School Building Authority. That is the agency that helps local communities to, um, to build schools or renovate schools. When we met with the MSBA, they were able to partner with us um, on a project up to a certain scope, which was 685 uh, kids. And so that actually wasn't one of the options if we were to be subject to um, this reimbursement. That's the first thing. The second point I want to make is that we have heard loud and clear from the community, I would say dating back as far as 2015, that um, the residents of Westwood like smaller schools. Um, that is an overarching theme that I hear at every group that I'm talking to. And if we were to consolidate three elementary schools into one, that would be 1,000 students. That would be a school the size of Westwood High School. And um, when we looked at that and sort of did our analysis, we felt like the educational um, concerns and the concerns from the community suggested that a smaller school um, was really um, more in keeping with where Westwood is. So I just wanted to explain that that was the thinking that went into that, that process. Okay, any other final questions? One, why don't you, one over here, one Amanda, and then Charlie, you want to say something? And then we're all gonna wrap up Q&A. Hi, um, Danielle, I have a question about redistricting. I know you had some ideas of what that might look like with the Hanlon Deerfield School. Is there any idea what that might look like with the Hanlon Sheehan School? The question, the question was, redistricting you guys we have some sense of what that would look like with Deerfield and Hanlon do we have any sense of what that would look like with the other two we have a sense of it yes um, and I will say not as good so um, if I can put put up the map here you'll get you know oh I'm realizing just how many things I have to flip through there we go okay um, yeah so, you know, we have an interesting geographical layout in Westwood, right? And um, so clearly we have Downey over here and sort of geographically, you're not gonna do much in terms of redistricting Downey because of where it is, right? If we um, were to try to consolidate Sheehan and Hanlon at the Hanlon site, you're now trying to get 685 students over to the Hanlon site. I think sometimes people are confused and they think, oh, when we say consolidate Sheehan and Hanlon, we just mean take all the kids who are currently at Sheehan and move them to Hanlon. That isn't what we would do. We would redistrict to try to realize some efficiencies. And so probably you'd be drawing a line here and creating like a new Martha Jones district 
probably moving some other people towards Deerfield, moving some, right. So it would involve a lot of shifting around of district lines. Similarly, if you said, well, now we need to move all the people who are currently in Hanlon over to Sheehan, that's a lot of movement, right? Because we're really only left with one school on that um, eastern side of town. And so you probably would be looking at a redistricting scenario where you have to redistribute students from Hanlon across different schools, if that makes sense, right? So, um, you know, certainly the redistricting plan would be more disruptive in those scenarios. And we'll look at those in much greater depth. The redistricting consultants have all kinds of interesting maps that show you where the different population centers are. Um, Amanda, do you have a question? Amanda Phillips, Webster Street. Um, I'm interested in that number 11, um, the school in the woods. I think that sounds really cool. It's hard without knowing how far back the property goes. It's hard to envision that. Can you give us a sense like how many yards back from the street that would be and how it might impact walkers? How far from the street? Or the street, like oh, how street. far from the street. street back. Uh. <laughs> Eleven. Here we go. So um, the best way to describe it here's here's Gay Street down here. So the existing fields are kind of down in this corner. You can make out the dash line of the existing building and the modulars. So right behind the modulars, and then kind of running right along this line here, is where that there's a kind of a toe of the hill, and it, it rises pretty quickly up into the woods, but anywhere from 12 to 15 feet as you uh, as you start working your way back into the woods. So uh, let's see, that's probably, if that's 50-ish yards, it's probably 150 yards back to the, to the building uh, in this particular plan. So here's, uh, here's Laura Lane, so you can see how the property runs around, wraps around the back of that uh, neighborhood. So we start getting up into the woods out beyond that. And then the, the, the acreage itself the, the 38 acres that makes up the woods, you know, that continues up, up into here. So there's quite a bit of land that still uh, remains potentially untouched or becomes outdoor education opportunities, uh, things of that nature. Thank you. Sure. And I had one other question, Tony. Um, so, Maya, you had mentioned that would move forward with the town after June. So would that um, school that isn't included, would, they be, would that be part of the vote in next year's town meeting or would that be something totally separate? So I think the timing of it wouldn't allow it to be at the same time. What we would ask for potentially at the same town meeting as the one where we go for the MSBA big vote is we would ask the town to, um, to fund design. So at that point we would have, we'd be in a place very similar to where we are now where, well, where we will be once we have a final project where we'd move, um, you know, we'd have one final project and we'd want to move into schematic design. And at that point, that's when we would ask the town to fund the schematic design program and then eventually to fund the construction itself. Um, and that would probably, we could potentially do the design vote at the same meeting that we ask the MSB, for the MSBA full, you know, the, the full project. It would put that school behind the, the MSBA school, but by maximum of a year, maybe six months to a year. Me again, sorry, I forgot one other thing about money that I think is very important. Um, so as we're thinking about going forward with this project, we're aware that the debt on the high school project will in fact be paid off in 2023 less you can. So um, as we think about that, that's another thing that we'll be factoring in in terms of looking at the impact on the tax bill. 
that um, right now we are paying for the high school and we would work the timing so that just at the time that that debt falls off, we would be taking on new debt for this project. It's certainly in no way going to be neutral, but um, that there will be a, um, some portion of the new debt that effectively is already in taxpayers' current tax bill, if that makes sense. Great. Charlie, did you have a final comment? And then we're going to wrap up Q&A. The, uh, the other thing is, in addition to what Emily just said, is that uh, you go to the town meeting and it's a problem. Uh, the 70-year-old buildings have to be, a lot of money has to be spent on them without state support. So that's going to be another issue uh, to somehow uh, go out and uh, we're, we're keeping them going. But very few towns in our in our league, competing with them, competing for quality education, have 70 year old buildings, as many as we have. So a lot has to be spent with state money or without it. And that's gonna be a part of the decision. But everything you, you said is uh, the tax implications are certainly a part of what we're considering. But this isn't, you know, just uh, forget it and uh, we'll move on. We're gonna have to do something. Uh, and with the opportunity for state support, it's. And the other thing was I give the administration a lot of credit. Uh, there are 100 school systems roughly applying for this to get in the line. Uh, and we're one of the few, maybe 17 school districts who were actually invited in to have this opportunity to get access to state money. So uh, it's a, I think when we balance it all off, uh, uh, it, it's gonna be actually a very cost-effective way to upgrade our, our educational system as opposed to being left to our, ourselves. So we're going to, I think, have a wrap-up uh, now from... I think we're going to turn it over. Um, Jason, are you taking it? Yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so with all of the other public meetings, uh, we want to continue the, the protocol of inviting uh, feedback and input on the project. And so uh, what we'll do tonight is ask you for two kinds of feedback in our same sort of post-it note technique that we've been using. The first kind of feedback is anything you want to uh, share with us about the options or the recommended short list, that would be valuable as the uh, school building committee will make you know, this short list official um, if, if everyone sort of agrees with that recommendation. Uh, any information they have to help them make that decision would be useful. The second kind of feedback uh, is related to um, one of the questions we had tonight. How do we make the next determination going from the many uh, to the few and then from the few to the one? And so we have a couple of boards back there. One of them is the evaluation criteria that we used in this step to go from the many to the few. Perhaps some of those criteria need to be reused in the next step. But we also want to open it up for more nuanced criteria. What information do you think will be important? What things do you think the school building committee and the district should consider in order to differentiate between, you know, now this short list of options in order to get us to the one. So we've got a board with this prompt uh, at the back of the room that we'd like you to just share um, that feedback on. And we'll let you do that at the end of the meeting so that we don't take time to do that now and then have to reconvene. So I don't know if uh, Emily or May, you want to talk about the next steps, but from the architectural side, this is what we have to do, right? We have to prepare the next um, we have to prepare this submission that's going in on March 20th, and we have to start the process of preparing the next submission, the preferred schematic report, where we do go from the, uh, from the few to the one. Uh, and these are some potential things that might be considered in those uh, evaluation criteria, redistricting, uh, design differences, uh, the impact of the building that's left out, and another round of cost estimates. And there may be others. And then there's a whole series of meetings uh, that are being proposed. I don't know if one of you guys want to talk about this list of meetings. So these are just dates to be aware of. Um, March 20th, again, that's the SBC vote where they'll vote to uh, whether they accept this short list that was recommended by the evaluation criteria subcommittee. Um, April 7th is the school committee meeting where our redistricting consultant will come and speak to us. Um, so that would be a really, a really great opportunity for the public to listen and see exactly what redistricting would entail. April 17th is another school building committee. We're going to um, review the selection criteria. What are we going to use to go from the few to the one? 
April 30th, this is a tentative date. Um, we just need to confirm it. But this is when we think there'll be another community presentation, this time specifically on redistricting. May 29th, the School Building Committee will review the final rec um, recommended option with cost. June 4th is going to be a very similar presentation to this where we will present what the evaluation criteria subcommittee is recommending as the final option and it will be discussing co costs as well so that's an important one again tentative but we will we'll announce the final date it, it, it's 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 more likely than not to be june 4th june 11th the school committee is going to consider enrollment and redistricting and will be voting on that whether or not there will be a redistricting or a consolidation of, of th uh, two schools. And finally, on June 12th, the school building committee is going to take the final vote on the preferred option um, that will then be submitted to the MSBA. So these are pretty important dates um, from now until June. So absolutely mark your calendars and we hope to see you at them. Again, if you have um, any feedback on any of the options or the criteria, please do so. Uh, stickies, and pens. stickies and pens, Mike, are going on, this table. Going on that table. <laughs> um, anything else, Don, anything else, Emily? So with that, we thank you for coming. Uh, we look forward to your feedback. <laughs>